The first session, Catherine Hayhoe, who I just mentioned, is, is the author of a book called Saving Us, which is extraordinary and primarily not so much about what's wrong with climate and how it's getting worse, although it is about that, and she's a global expert on that, but how to explain it to people who don't accept it or don't agree with you or don't understand it. So the marketing thing Jim mentioned. She's chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Um, she's a endowed professor at Texas Tech University, and there's a whole bunch of other great things I could say about her. She is going to be our one virtual speaker. So. We, she's so, she only, almost only does virtual talks because she doesn't like to fly, so she has her reasons. Um, Jeff Nesbitt, come on up, Jeff. Jeff will be interviewing her from here. Jeff is executive director of Climate Nexus, uh, which is, uh, and he's somebody we're very happy that EDF helped us connect with, and he's had a long history in government, um, and he's one of the world's leading and most veteran climate communicators, so turning it over to you. Great. And the clock needs to be reset because it has to start <laughs> now. Yeah, Dr. Hale, you're already eight minutes in. You didn't know it yet, so. We can so. talk fast, Jeff. <laughs> okay, I can talk fast. I, I have to say it is really my, my great privilege to introduce you to Dr. Hale. If you've not read her book, please do so. It's an extraordinary book. Um, if you've not heard her TED Talk, um, the most important thing you can do to fight climate change Watch it, five million people have already watched it as a TED Talk, it's one of the most popular TED Talks in history. Um, she's probably the most popular scientist, climate scientist on earth now. Her social media following is uh, extraordinary. So um, it, 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 as mentioned, she's the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy. Um, she's an endowed professor at um, Texas Tech University. She's also time, one of Time's 100 most influential people um, she's written for the New York Times and other national publications, um, and she's got her um, MS and PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois at, at, at Urbana-Champaign. So um, I think you're going to enjoy her talk. So Dr. Hejo, uh, go ahead. It's great to be here with you. So uh, I, uh, I think we're going to have a dialogue, actually. Okay. Uh, because, you know, you and Jeff, we, we've known each other for, for quite some time. And Jeff, your own career has transitioned um, in many different ways into where you are with Climate Nexus right now. Um, yeah. And so I think this would just be a great opportunity for us to talk about, um, you know, back in the day, you know, you were actually a federal employee back in the day. And that <laughs> was back in the day when people thought, if we just tell people the facts, surely they'll change their minds. And now you're at Climate Nexus, which is all about sharing with people why this matters and how this is affecting us here and now and tackling the two problems that I talk about in my TED Talk and my book, which is number one, psychological distance. We humans see this as a distant issue in space or time rather than being something that matters to us here and now in ways that are relevant to us today. And the second problem is we don't think we can fix it. Either we feel a stunning lack of efficacy. We feel like there's nothing we can do that could make a difference. Or there's many people who feel that the cure is worse than the disease, that the solutions they feel would leave us worse off than we were, would be just coping with the impacts, which of course is completely opposite. So um, if you don't mind, I'll start with you, Jeff, and then you can get All back right. to me. Great. How, uh, how uh, have uh, you seen this trajectory shift over the last you know, 15 years? So let's go back in time a little bit to the National Science Foundation. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the National Climate, Assess Climate Assessment, Dr. Hayhoe was a lead author on the second, third, and fourth National Climate Assessment. But when I was at the National Science Foundation in the second Bush administration, um, there was an effort to slow down that National Climate Assessment. And so there was quite an effort in my office and others to, bring, to allow that to go out and go forward. And if you all then you know, fast forward, uh, during the Trump administration, President Trump's staff decided to release that National Climate Assessment on a Black Friday after Thanksgiving. So I want to use that. I want to, I want to toss you a tough question, Dr. Hale. So I'm going to use um, ex-President Donald Trump's current climate denial talking point that he just trotted out at his latest rally. Um, he, he actually was a three-for-one talking point. So he, he invoked John Kerry in his punchline. He also described sea level rise as only rising one hundredth of one percent. And then he finished it up with over blank, 300 blanking years. And the crowd roared when he used, when he tried that out. So you get three for one in that, in that statement. You get invoking a Democratic politician, 
which gets the crowd going. You then minimize the risk of, of climate change on sea level rise, and then you put it way, way, way out in time as a distant threat. So you get three for the price of one in that one climate denial talking point. So I'm curious, because you speak to a lot of um, uh, uh, either evangelical Christian audiences or Republican audiences, is there any chance to like change that conversation that they're, they're hearing from their Republican leaders? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that was a great example of really effective denial. It's actually a very clever way to get people to dismiss this risk because you're reinforcing their perceptions of psychological distance to the issue and you're reinforcing the ideological divide, two things that will keep people from demanding climate solutions. So here in the United States, what's really interesting is back at the time when the first national climate assessment was enacted back in 2000, at that time, according to Gallup polls, Democrats and Republicans were pretty much on the same page when it came to climate change. What happened? Did the science change? No, the science has been solid since the 1850s, which is when we scientists, and I shouldn't say we, because I certainly wasn't alive back then, but it's when scientists connected digging up and burning fossil fuels to increasing levels of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. What changed was that we started to see the impacts here and now. And that meant that action was necessary. And as soon as action became necessary, that is when the denial began. Because if we say, sure, this is a real problem and it's urgent and it's affecting the most marginalized and vulnerable people today, but I don't want to fix it, that makes us a bad person. And most people don't want to perceive themselves as a bad person. And most other people don't want others to perceive them as a bad person. So instead, we come up with excuses plausible excuses for why action isn't needed. And those plausible excuses actually fall into one of five categories. I've run into thousands of these over the years, and I think you can sort them all into one of five categories. It isn't real. It isn't human caused. It isn't bad, you know, sea level rise, you know, whatever percentage of whatever over X number of years, <laughs> it's not bad. It's too, we don't want to fix it because it's too expensive financially or it's too expensive ideologically. You'd have to give in to all the demands from the opposite end of the political spectrum. We don't want to fix it. That's number four. And then number five is a really good one that we've seen arising just recently. Oh, it's too late. You really should have warned us earlier. There's no point doing anything now. <laughs> so so what, that, that, what Trump's statement hit was it hit number three and number four. It doesn't really matter to us and we don't want to fix it anyways because it's all on those people over there. And what those do is they give us excuses, excuses to ignore the fact that a hurricane does not knock on your door and ask who you voted for in the last election before it floods your home and rips off your roof. A wildfire doesn't ask for your voting record before it destroys your neighborhood. Climate change affects all of us to the point where to care about it, we only have to be one thing. And that one thing is quite literally a human being living on planet Earth. And we're all that. But how do we tackle this divide that you mentioned? This is what I've spent a lot of my time working on. And with people who are at the very far end, in many cases, you can't. When we think about having constructive conversations, we often think of that person in our life who's dismissive, who brings up, you know, climate change isn't real, it's just a hoax. Every single conversation they have, they're always posting on social media, they're always bringing it up. And we think, oh, so there's a secret, I can talk to them and this is how it'll work. No, the secret with those 8% dismissives is it takes a miracle to change their minds. And unless you're in the miracle business, and I don't think I am personally, we're not the right person to change their minds. But they're only 8%. And for everybody else, it turns out 70% of us are worried. 83% of moms are worried. 86% of young people are worried. But 50% of us feel hopeless and helpless and don't know what to do. So if we begin by talking about something we have in common rather than something that divides us, and research shows that if we talk about what's happening where we live here and now in ways that affect us, like the safety of our homes or the quality of the air that we're breathing, it can overcome our political divides because we're focusing on something that we share that's more relevant to our lives than something that divides us. So what Dr. Hayhoe is talking about, for those of you who are not familiar with Tony Lys Dr. Lyserowitz's research and, and Dr. Ed Maybach's research at George Mason, um, they've been charting the six Americas. There are six different sort of demographic populations that care to uh, uh, varying degrees about climate change and view its impacts. And over the last 10 to 12 years, quite a few Americans have grown 
fairly concerned about climate change. There's, there's a, still a, a polarized end of one part of the spectrum. It's a roughly about 30 percent. Um, but even but those who outright dismiss climate change um, are in single digits now. So I'm just I also wanted to, if you don't mind, Dr. Hale, I'd like to talk to you about Facebook a little bit. I know you've had some trouble on Facebook. Um, we're here at a te technology conference. Do you view Facebook as a problem for climate misinformation? Um, it's the biggest social platform in the world. There's lots and lots of climate misinformation on that platform. Um, do you view Facebook as a problem? And if so, what do you think we can do about it? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, um, all social media outlets are tools that can be used for good or for bad. And often we see a lot of news about how they're being used for bad. Um, but what I try to do myself, and I, you know, I've been active on social media for a long time on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and I'm trying out TikTok with the help of my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be totally honest, the cat gets more views than I do, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I truly believe in the power of social media to reach people around the world. And um, I, I mean, I've had so many positive, constructive stories of people who have engaged on social media, not dismissives, mm. but people who were just detached. They didn't think this mattered or they had questions or they didn't understand why it mattered to them as a mother or as, you know, somebody living in a certain place or as a person of faith. And because of the information that they were able, able to access on social media, they've sent me messages saying, hey, this issue never mattered to me before. But I sort of found you through this roundabout circuitous route and I sort of, you know, lurked on your Facebook page or listened into your Instagram lives and I completely changed my mind. I understand now why this matters and I'm all in. In fact, I just got solar panels or I just did this or at COP, the big climate meeting in Glasgow, I had the best experience where I ended up going to a dinner and it was a dinner where I didn't have to speak and it was, you know, at the end of a long day and I was thinking, oh, do I really want to go to this? But I thought, well, they'll have a plate with my name on it and I don't want to not show. Mm -hmm. So I dragged myself over to the dinner thinking, oh, I'm so tired. I just want to put my feet up. And I walk into the room and I see this young man across the room who I didn't recognize, but he looks at me like he knows me. And then he runs across the room and he says, <laughs> are you Dr. Hayo? And I said, yes. And he said, I'm Dion. I said, Dion, I know you. You've been following me on Facebook for like five or six years. You've been listening to all my Facebook lives. You've been commenting. And he's like, yes. He said, I never cared about climate change until I ran into you on social media. I've been following everything you do. I've watched all your videos. And I am now an official delegate for my country to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Wow. That is the incredible power of social media. I mean, that just gives me chills down my back. So what could we do to make social media more effective? Well, we know that we can no longer afford to be naive. And unfortunately, a lot of social media companies went into this very naively. They didn't realize how their platforms could literally be weaponized to uh, foment dissent, to spread misinformation, to exacerbate the divisions between and within our societies today. The United States is now more politically polarized than it's been any time since the Civil War. And social media plays a role in that because experiment upon experiment has shown that the social media algorithms, which are just generated to basically make money, they deliberately tribalize and in some cases even radicalize us. And they're doing that, again, naively for their own purposes, but they have to realize the impact this is having on the breakdown of society. And so this has to be addressed directly. And some companies have started to try to do that. Like YouTube has a little, you know, definition, a link to Wikipedia wow. under its videos. Mm -hmm. But after somebody watches one of my global weirding episodes on YouTube, I have this little series called global weirding I do with PBS. They're often directed to a Prager U video, which of course contains nothing resembling science. It's full of mm -hmm. misinformation. And Facebook decided that Back in August 2018, I know exactly when it was because I could see the impact. They didn't announce this, but I could see it. They decided that, first of all, clean energy was a political topic. And so all of a sudden, our global weirding episodes on clean energy could no longer be boosted on Facebook. And then a couple of weeks later, they decided climate change was a political topic. So I, a scientist, could no longer boost um, you know, PBS um, little videos on Facebook on climate change. Right. So I complained about it and they said, that's okay. You just have to register as a political organization. <laughs> and I said, over my dead and decomposing body, am I a climate scientist registering as a political organization? <laughs> <laughs> 
A thermometer is not Democrat or Republican. And this information applies equally to everyone. So then a few months later, they modified it. So they said, well, you just have to uh, register. So I tried to register and they turned me down. And so after that, I just kind of gave up. And what happened was my Facebook, it, it wasn't just that you can't boost. There's an algorithm that is definitely downweighting my page because I was tracking my growth rates and my growth rate, which was, you know, doubling every six months regularly for years, um, my growth rate declined. And now f since 2018, I think my page has increased by about, um, what percent would it be? About... 3%. It's increased by 3% rather than doubling every six months, 3% over three years. Right. So, so they're trying, but they're not getting it right. <laughs> and on, on, on Twitter, um, I have a huge block list of automated trolls. There's bot detectors that identify the trolls. I just got one today that had a 97% rating on the bot detector, but there's no way to, you know, get rid of them other than blocking them yourself right. on YouTube. I mentioned the problems there on LinkedIn. LinkedIn says you can report people for misinformation. So I started to report misinformation because it's rampant in my comments on LinkedIn. And I would get an Insta reply saying, our team has thoroughly reviewed, thoroughly reviewed in one nanosecond, <laughs> the report and found no conflict. And so I started to reply and say, no, I will give you peer reviewed citations for exactly why they're wrong. And I got into it with LinkedIn and they kept saying, oh, we're doing it, but they weren't. So finally, I think they eventually responded to one or two of the many reports I made. And then somebody reported one of my posts and they censored my post on LinkedIn, which had <laughs> peer reviewed <laughs> citations. So all that to say, the companies are aware of the problem. They are certainly making steps, but they are tripping over their shoelaces and landing on their faces when it comes to really tackling misinformation in a productive and constructive way. That's absolutely the case. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I've, had the, I've had a chance to talk to some of the directors of the various programs at Facebook. They are very, very aware of the climate misinformation problem. Their solution right now is to have a climate information page with only IPCC materials on it, and they're not boosting any, anyone else's content, which I happen to think is a big mistake. You need to flood the zone. But that leads me to my next question for you, the IPCC report. For those of you who are not familiar, the IPCC, every seven years, uh, thousands of scientists contribute to the IPCC reports. There are three working group reports. The first and the second have come out in the, in the most, uh, probably the last six weeks. The third and final working group, which will be the final piece of this seven year IPCC report will be out in, in, a, in, in I think less than two weeks. Dr. Hayhoe, once this, this particular IPCC report is issued, I'm not sure people realize this, but it'll be another seven years until the end of this decade um, before we see another consensus scientific report. So my question is, this is the scientist's last best shot to tell everybody you need to get serious about this and do something because we're gonna approach 1.5C toward the end of this decade. We might cross it, we might not. So what can scientists do after this final IPCC report to continue their work in, in, t in talking to corporations um, and government leaders about this issue? Well. The, the original purpose of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports was to summarize the huge body of scientific literature, thousands of peer-reviewed studies, on a regular basis to provide input to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Negotiations that led to the Paris Agreement. So that's the actual official role of the IPCC reports. But over time, they have obviously become uh, a means to raise awareness around the world about the urgency and severity of this issue. So they come in three volumes. Volume one is the physical science. It came out in August last year, and it talks about what's happening to the ice sheets, what's happening to the oceans, what future projections will look like and how much hotter it will be and how many more heat waves we'll have and how frequent you know, droughts will get and floods and how much stronger hurricanes will be. Volume two that came out a couple of weeks ago, it's on the impacts. It talks about what is happening in each region of the world and how we are already starting to adapt, but nowhere near fast enough. The first report was nicknamed the Code Red Report because it showed how climate is changing faster than any time in the history of human civilization on this planet, and that's why it matters. So that was the Code Red Report. The second report about the impacts, I call the Your House is on Fire. Literally, you are in the house, it is on fire, and now is the time to do something about it. And then, 
the third report that's coming out in two weeks is here's the instruction manual for the fire extinguisher. <laughs> that's what volume three is. Volume three looks at the technology. It looks at the pathways to solutions. It looks at decarbonizing the economy. What could we do in response? And to be totally honest, Jeff, we have everything we need to take action now. In fact, we've already had most of what we need to take action now for quite some time. We didn't need to wait for another report, but we have what we need. And if we said, oh, well, we'll just wait for another report. We'll just wait to see how much worse it is seven years. It's going to be too late by that. So it's time to move on from the reports to action. We don't need, and I'm a scientist, we don't need more science. That's not what we most urgently need. We need real solutions right now that do three things. Solutions that stop putting so much carbon into the atmosphere. Solutions that take carbon out of the atmosphere through nature-based solutions, as well as high-tech solutions like direct air capture. And we need solutions that build resilience to the impacts of climate change. I think of the atmosphere as a swimming pool. And it has a naturally occurring level of CO2 in the swimming pool or water. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a hose in the swimming pool and we've been turning the hose up every year. We have to turn the hose off. We have to make the drain bigger to take more carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in ecosystems, grasslands, wetlands, and soils where we want it. And we have to learn how to swim. And we need to do every single one of those. It's not either or, it's all three as much as possible, as soon as possible, because here's the conclusion of the thousands of pages of IPCC reports. This is their conclusion. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters, every choice matters, and every action matters. And that is the only mandate we need from the science to take action now. That's tr tremendous. I, again, couldn't agree more. So my final question for you, I, I had a chance to speak to Adam McKay. He's the director of the very popular Netflix film, Don't Look Up. It was quite a film. The, the scientist um, had a prominent role in that, fi in that feature film. But to be perfectly blunt, I was a bit disappointed when I was talking to Adam. His, his under he was, he was, he was um, very outraged that no one had listened to scientists yet. He was outraged at the media. And, the, and Netflix, when they, when they promoted that film, their promotion for what people should do was literally just eat more veggies. And that was it. Now, that's pretty disappointing to me. That film was wildly popular. It raised awareness. Um, yet there were almost no solutions for ordinary people. I mean, anybody who, you know, when you talk to folks, you, you get people pretty excited uh, about trying to understand climate change. And then they ask you, what can I do? So I'm going to ask you right now, what can I do or what can anyone do once they've heard about climate change if they're not a government leader or a corporate CEO? Well, often we focus on our personal carbon footprint and we think I will look at how I eat, how I travel, how I live, all of the different activities in my life that produce heat trapping gas emissions. And don't get me wrong, we should and I do. And that's part of the reason why I'm speaking to you now like this. But I've done the math. And if every single one of us who's worried about climate change did everything we could to cut our personal carbon footprint, that wouldn't even take care of 20% of the problem. Not even 20%. So then people say, oh, well then as an individual, there's nothing I can do. Absolutely not. But as Bill McKibben says, the most important thing an individual can do right now is not be such an individual. What does that mean? It means when we engage and focus on our, excuse me, our climate shadow, rather than our carbon footprint. When we look at how we influence the place we work, the place we live, the organizations that we're part of, when we use our voice to advocate for change, if we look back in history at how major societal changes have happened from the abolition of slavery to women getting the vote to civil rights being enacted to apartheid ending, it did not begin with individuals taking individual action in their individual personal lives. It began with individuals and not famous, rich, influential individuals with really ordinary individuals of no particular power or wealth or fame, but people who had the courage of their conviction using their voice to advocate for that change, to call for action at every level, not just the federal level, we often focus there. Cities are much more nimble and much more bipartisan. States, corporations, universities, churches, neighborhoods, 
all kinds of organizations can take action together. And that's how change happens. So I was asked by Netflix, along with about 30 other experts, to help design a climate action website to go with Don't Look Up after it came out. Because <laughs> I completely agree with you, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we did. And here's what we found. I can share my desktop with you. So I'm going to do that very briefly. If you Google Don't Look Up, climate platform, you'll have a picture of Leonardo DiCaprio looking anguished saying, love living on planet Earth, but hate planet killing comets, ready to stop freaking out and start doing something. And then here are the top six things an individual can do. This engages us within our society, within our system, starting a conversation, joining a group to boost our impact together, making our money count, of course, keeping our politicians accountable, sparking ideas at work and at school, pushing for climate headlines. And then if you click on see all steps at the bottom here, it will take you further down to where we start to see cut your food waste, eat more veggies, switch to clean energy, get around greener, fly less, and be kind to your mind. Very important. (laughs) But this really does a good job of focusing on how we as individuals truly can make a difference. And that's why I wrote my book, Saving Us. I wrote my book to answer the two questions I get all the time which is what gives you hope and how can I make a difference and how can I talk about this issue? And I'll I'll put this in the chat because I see quite a few people online asking for the link, but each of us truly can make a difference. And it begins with using something every one of us has, which is quite literally our voice. Which is a tremendous way to close this conversation. I wanted to thank you very much for this. Um, For those of you who've not, Uh, picked up her book, buy it, Saving Us. If you've not watched her TED Talk, watch it. If you've not followed her on Twitter or Facebook or or talked to Facebook about um, making making sure that they boost her videos, please do so. Um, Dr. Hayhoe, thanks very much. This was a tremendous conversation.